Good morning, folks. Welcome back to Advanced Higher Chemistry. I'd like to tackle alkene reaction mechanism, alkene addition reaction mechanisms, actually. I'm a Muppet. Uh, three different ones here. It's SQA page 93. I'd like to look at adding a simple bromine onto an alkene. I'd like to looking at I'd like to look at adding a hydrogen halide like HBr onto an alkene. And lastly, I'd like to look at acid catalyzed hydration of an alkene, oddly enough. Um, they all involve these curly arrow things, guys. Now, just a very quick uh, resume of the curly arrows. They show the movement of a pair of electrons if it's got a double head like that. If it's a single electron, unpaired electron like radicals, uh, it looks like that. Um, and it shows where the electrons start and where they're going to. Do you have a choice on where they're going to? You can actually draw them right to the atom they're going to bond to, or you could draw them in space where the bond is going to form. Both seem to be acceptable by the SQA. So let's have a look at the first one first, oddly enough. Let's have a look at number one. Um, this is Br2 and an alkene. If you haven't watched the video on the true nature of molecular orbitals and stuff, go and watch it now. I'll put a link up here. Because I'm assuming that you realise that this double bond is a big cloud of electron density. It's a big cloud of negativity in space. It's much like your average um, conspiracy theorist. A big cloud of negativity. And um, it's going to be attracted to electrophiles and positively charged things. And the last time I checked, a bromine molecule is completely non-polar according to higher. That is true. But what happens is, as this approaches this big cloud of electrons, these pi bonds in space here, or this pi bond, sorry, in space here, then this molecule becomes polarised. The pair of electrons moves down a little bit, which means this effectively becomes slightly delta plus, and this becomes slightly delta minus, caused by the presence of this double bond. Now, that means we can take uh, the electrons here, and we can move them in to attack this, and that will cause, like dominoes toppling, that will cause that to go down to there. Now, we are getting there. The question is, do we create a carbon with a carbon and then does the bromine bond to just this carbon, leaving this with a positive charge? That wouldn't be massively stable. Nature likes the lowest energy configuration possible. And because this bromine is flipping massive as atoms go, then it's able to do a clever trick. Discovered in the 30 odds, I think, it's able to form a triangular intermediate. There is still a positive charge going on here, <clears throat> but it's stabilised by being spread over three atoms instead of just localised to one. How clever is that? And of course, we have a Br- floating about in space. So this is your intermediate, triangular intermediate. Does it happen with iodine? Yes, it does definitely, because iodine is larger. Does it happen with chlorine? Eh, I couldn't find any written evidence of that, although the SQA asked it once. So let's just assume it does and keep them happy. Uh, does it happen with fluorine? No, no way. It's way too small to bridge these two atoms. <coughs> so what's the final stage? Well, the final stage is that we've got a negative charge here and it's going to come in to uh, attack one of these carbons and this pair of electrons is going to collapse down onto there and you're going to end up making your final product, which is one, two, Dibromoethane. Okay, that's bromination. Let's do number two. Hydrogen halide. So, uh, number two is HBr, for example, and let's do propene, and you'll see why, rather than uh, ethene. If you do it with propene, um, you sort of seem to have a choice. You can have... One, two, three, I'm being lazy. I've got my degree in chemistry, so it says I don't have to draw in all the carbons on my degree. So there. Uh, you've got HBr, which is nice because it's already polarised. Delta minus, delta plus. So we can have this pair of electrons coming out to here. And then that causes that bond to collapse. And you will form... Uh, let's see the bromine bond, sorry, the hydrogen, I'm, my apologies, the hydrogen bonds to there. You've got your two hydrogens on here, and that's Br- minus floating about. This is a carbocation. And uh, then the last stage of this reaction would be this can come into attack here, and we get uh, 
one bromopropane. Okay, the other option that would seem to be around is that you can have same process here. Um, this time though, and you've got your HBR, so this comes to attack the hydrogen, fine. This collapses down, fine, no difference so far. But let's just say that this one, this time becomes the carbocation and the hydrogen attaches to this one. So our intermediate this time around would look like this. So that's our carbocation, and of course we have a bromine. And then the last stage is pretty much just the same. Uh, so we'll create two bromopropane this time. Now at first glance you might expect there to be a 50-50 mixture between one bromo and two bromopropane. In fact, orange seriously wins the day. I think it's something like 90%, don't quote me on that. I need to go and look up the exact figures. And only 10% happens this way. Now, depending on how much of the course you've already covered, you might have heard about something called inductive stabilization. Now, that means that carbocations, as you might imagine, are not terribly stable uh, things in space. And if there's any way to stabilize them, like, for example, this triangular cheat intermediate, then that will happen. Now, what happens here uh, is you've got a carbocation in the middle, and to either side of it, it's got six and an extra nine electrons here and another nine electrons here, and they are able to offer some of their electron density and effectively reduce that down a little bit and make it less positive. So we have a happier carbocation intermediate. In reality, they don't get happy. I know, don't show to me. It can survive for longer periods, this intermediate. Therefore, this reaction path here is more likely to happen just by the law of large numbers. If this exists for a much shorter time, because you can't do inductive stabilization from two carbons away, you can only do it from its neighbor. So this guy here has only got three elect two electrons, sorry, on one side, and eight electrons from here, whereas this has got a lot more. So this one here is exists for a shorter amount of time, so that's why you get less product of one bromopropane compared to two bromopropane. This is called Markovnikov's law. Now I'm just going to go and get the spelling of the man's name so we don't disrespect him. So Markovnikov's rule law, whatever you want to call it, is that when you have an asymmetrical alkene, like this for example, then you end up uh, with the secondary carbocation being much more stable than a primary carbocation. It's right at the end of the chain there. This is in the middle. You get inductive stabilization and therefore you tend to form the two bromo pro product rather than the one bromo product. Lastly, let's do a um, let's do an acid catalyzed hydration, guys, on uh, ethene. In fact, let's just keep it simple. Life is complex enough. Um, you can imagine that if you tried to add a water molecule to an alkene then that is a no-go. You've got two non-bonded electrons here, so nice and negative, and you've got a pi bond here, nice and negative. They're going to repel, which is why you need an acid to catalyze this reaction. So if we throw in an acid in the form of H plus ions, what goes on here? Well, the first step is we've now got a nice electrophile which means that this bond here can collapse down onto here and we will create that and a carbocation and of course our water is still nearby and the water at this point goes hello I've got nucleophilic tendencies and there's a nice big positive charge excellent so this can go and attack here. And then we create the third step, which I'm an idiot because I've run out of space. Sorry about that. Look at this. What on earth is going to be going on here? 
So if you look here, by the way, guys, there is a one plus charge here present, which means there sort of needs to be a one plus charge at each step. It's just a wee way of making sure that you've got everything going on. Right, so this is going to look really odd. <laughs> You're going to have an oxygen, which is now attached to, this is a data bond, by the way, of course, um, attached to two hydrogens. Now, I did say there's a positive charge still here. Going to have to have a positive charge here as well. wonder if you can work out where it is. It's actually on that oxygen. And as you can imagine, that also is not very happy. So, how do we get rid of this? Well, if you remember, acid-catalyzed hydration produces an alcohol. We are nearly there, aren't we? We've just got one too many H's on here. So, what we can do is we can collapse that onto there. And we end up forming... So going around the circle here, I apologise. You can do mechanisms in any order you like, as long as... Well, not in any order you like, in any layout you like. Um, OH, and three H's here. Oh, look, we've made our alcohol. Are we done? Not quite, of course. I said you had to have a positive charge. And the positive charge now is you have regenerated the acid catalyst. Ah, look, it can go back and do its acid thing all over again. That's why it's catalysis. No, it's not the same H, by the way, interestingly. Nowhere near the same H, but it still works. So that's acid-catalyzed hydration. Let me just check and see if I've missed out any subtleties the SQA want you to be aware of in any of these three reactions. Nope, I'm pretty sure that's it, guys. So very quick summary again. We had, uh, number one, we had bromination, which turns out to be a bit more complex than we explained to you in fourth year. <laughs> I wonder why. Um, so bromination forms this triangular intermediate in order to stabilize the carbocation, which would be not very stable otherwise. Um, then we had Markovnikov rule when it applies to adding HBr or hydrogen halides in general um, to asymmetric alkenes. You will always the SQA quota as the hydrogen ends up being bonded to the carbon that's already got most hydrogens on it, which is probably the most clumsy wording ever. In other words. Uh, this carbon here is one hydrogen, this carbon here had two, so this hydrogen is going to end up joining to that carbon. But here is the why. Um, inductive stabilization is why that happens. Because the secondary carbocation is more stable than the primary carbocation, which means, as I said earlier on, it survives for longer. Inductive stabilization also, whoops, inductive stabilization, if I can fit it in also is a key player in SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. And I'll try and put a link if you haven't seen the video. I've done one for that as well. So this is a concept that we have come across before. Possibly not, depending on which way around you're doing the course. Uh, and then number three was... Uh, I've lost number three. Number three was... Oh yeah, acid-catalyzed hydration. You can add water straight to an alkene because water is nucleophilic and an alkene hates nucleophiles because it's also negative. It wants electrophiles, and that's why we needed this little H plus to catalyze it in the first place. And I think we're done. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye bye.